All right, in this lecture, um, I'm going to give a, a general overview of the history of gladiatorial combat. So we'll talk about where did gladiator, uh, the gladiatorial fighting come from, the sort of people who were gladiators, the, briefly the venues where they fought, their daily life, and uh, their death. So we're covering quite a large topic, so I'll keep at a, a, a steady pace, and we'll have questions at the end. So um, gladiatorial combat is just such a part of the Roman world that we automatically associate uh, the gladiatorial fights uh, with particularly the imperial period, but actually gladiatorial fighting goes back into the Republican period, and its origins go back uh, beyond that. Um, the painting that I'm showing you dates to the late 19th century. It's obviously a romantic view of, of gladiatorial combat. Um, and it showed uh, the death of the gladiator and the participation of the crowd. But uh, we now know that uh, the thumbs down signal isn't right. Uh, that um, in actual fact, it was a thumbs up indicated kill him. Uh, so we'll talk about that. So history, the study of the inscriptions and the evidence has uh, changed our views to some extent. The Romans did not invent gladiatorial combat, but they made it an industry. It was something uh, that brought a lot of wealth to people. The origins of um, gladiatorial combat actually uh, stem from the Etruscan world. Um, we know from a number of uh, ancient texts, inscriptions, a Greek author, Athenaeus, wrote in the first century AD about the origins of gladiatorial combat in a way that the Romans didn't talk about the origins of these things. So Livy doesn't talk about the origins of gladiatorial combat, possibly because everybody already knew about it, so why uh, discuss it? So it came, it, our information of this early days of gladiatorial fighting comes from external Greek texts. And he cites an earlier uh, historian Nicolaus of Damascus who's, um, who did discuss the origins of uh, gladiatorial combat from the Etruscans. The Etruscans in their tombs at Tarquinia often represent activities taking place at the funeral and what they show are, are often religious rites but included in those rites are the uh, competitions that took place at the grave. These are funerary graves. And one of the most famous of these Tarquinian tombs, the tomb of the augurs, actually shows a painting in which um, a man who is tied up is being ripped to death by a dog. And this is um, meant to be taking place outside the tomb. And you would suggest, well, why uh, tie someone up and have them ripped to pieces. Uh, I'm thinking Ramsey Bolton here, actually, as I speak. <laughs> um, from Game of Thrones. Um, uh, why do that? Well, there's uh, a well-known reason. There was a long-established tradition of killing people at funerals. And that tradition uh, it was found through many societies, ancient societies around the Mediterranean, not just the Etruscans, but elsewhere. And if you think about uh, the Iliad, the famous burial of Patroclus, the lover of Achilles, is accompanied by funerary games in which people are competing, but also with the sacrifice of Trojan prisoners. And you execute, you execute people so that their blood goes into the ground and the life force of that blood is going to be transmitted to the dead person and en en energize them. Okay? So you're giving a blood sacrifice of captured prisoners 
uh, a sacri human sacrifice to reanimate, to sustain, and and, uh, and revive the dead in a way. And such scenes of prisoner sacrifice are found frequently. This is a famous um, tomb, Etruscan tomb at Vulci, the Francois tomb, in which Trojan prisoners are being killed. So the blood is descending, as I said, to give life force to the, to the dead, the, your dead relative. Uh, early Christian writers, particularly Tertullian, who was writing around 200 AD, talk about these and, said, and say that um, it was an old custom to sacrifice, make a, a sacrifice of human uh, blood at the funeral, uh, to sacrifice a captive or a poor slave, a slave of poor value. Uh, as a way of comforting the dead. You're providing um, the life force to the dead to sustain them. So certainly uh, the ancient authors talk about the origins of gladiatorial combat in the Roman world as coming from the, these Etruscan funerary rites. Um, likewise, um, the Campanian tombs of South Italy. These are Greek colonists settled in southern Italy. They also had funerary games which would include chariot races, fist fights and duels between soldiers and sometimes these uh, battle scenes are represented. So this is a tomb fresco from Paestum in southern Italy and it shows combat at a funeral and quite often the competitors are naked and their blood is the thing that's being emphasized there. It's a blood sacrifice that's taking place. Uh, so we often see combat between armed men with spears and lances, sometimes wearing tunics but often naked at these funerary games. So the tradition, this tradition harks back to the traditions of the Trojan War that uh, from the uh, Dark Ages, from the 8th century BC. The, you're looking back to those activities that are described in Homer as a model for um, how a grand funeral should be run. You have a blood sacrifice of old and tired slaves whose blood is to be uh, absorbed by the earth. Sometimes the fighters at these funerary games are represented wearing armor so they have helmets, shields and uh, a chest plate quite often. So this is exactly what's being represented here. So these seem to be the origins of Roman gladiatorial combat, funerary games, um, a, a blood sacrifice. The um, origins of animal combat and the appearance of exotic wild animals in Rome seems to begin with the 3rd century BC. This is the period of the Great Triumphs um, where the conquest of Carthage enabled the presentation of many exotic African animals in Rome. They would be led in the military triumph behind the general, so you would bring an elephant uh, and other exotic animals to entertain the crowd. And then what do you do with them? You have these wild animals that have been brought over from the conquered territories and uh, the tradition developed of putting them to fight each other in a, in a public venue in Rome. So once the animals have been brought, you're not going to keep them. You either put them in an enclosed place and you have someone hunting them or you let them fight each other. And that seems to be the origin of Roman um, exotic wild animals coming to Rome and being incorporated into entertainment. Um, the earliest gladiatorial combats are taking place 264 BC in Rome. And in each of the early 
these early Republican examples of gladiatorial combat, they're all funerary games. So usually it's a reference to the sons of a wealthy and important politician put on uh, funerary games for their dead father and they would normally have two or three pairs of fighters, uh, usually slaves, captured slaves, fighting to the death. The, the aim is to provide an entertainment to the crowd, but also a blood sacrifice to their dead father. So they often talk about that as that's what it's the main purpose of these early gladiatorial fights were. There were funerary games. Um, and they're harking back to the Iliad, etc. for those. Um, the earliest uh, of these Finry game gladi gladiators are traditionally prisoners of war or slaves facing each other in contest. Um, and we know of quite a, a number of examples from the second and the first century uh, BC. That's an example of a, a relief from the Ashmolean. As time progresses in the second century, there's much more of an organized sense of these activities. So what had previously been, let's set two slaves to fight each other at the tomb of my father, has now become a much more grand event. So by 183 BC, we can talk about um, Amunus. Amunus is a, um, a fight. Uh, the Munira are the fights. And these are privately organized funerary games. Uh, one, the best known example is for Publius Licinius. 60 pairs of gladiators fought each other as a grand blood sacrifice for the death of this Republican official. Uh, so you're making a statement about your... Um, it's conspicuous consumption, isn't it? You're killing <laughs> slaves, uh, you're getting rid of their labor and making a sacrifice to your dead father. Um, so that's the origins of the gladiatorial combat. Wealthy families trying to impress with conspicuous consumption and uh, these poor slaves <laughs> uh, dying as well. So we have a couple of uh, inscriptions which say a good son will put on some funerary games and spill some blood for my uh, memory, that sort of thing. The earliest uh, of these gladiatorial fighters um, are wearing a sublia garclum, a loincloth. That seems to be uh, what's represented and what's referred to. Most of the fighters are either naked or wearing a loincloth in the first days of gladiatorial combat in Rome. So they're not wearing armor. They're just, they might have a shield and a loincloth and that's it. And you fight to the death or are put to death. They could also have a belt around their waist um, as well. And sometimes they're shown with greaves to protect their lower legs from, uh, from damage, but that's it. So pretty, it would have been fairly gruesome. There's not that much evidence visually and textually from the Republican period for the appearance of gladiators. And we really have to wait for imperial Roman mosaics to really give us the fine detail of these events. The first to the third century AD. But we know that um, gladiatorial combat was being turned into a profession already in the late first century BC, particularly, certainly by the time of Julius Caesar, uh, and particularly under Augustus. It's becoming a, um, a profession. Uh, it's becoming an industry to entertain the crowds rather than to provide blood offerings to dead relatives. <laughs> 
Um, we know that uh, most of the gladiators of the late Republican period and into the imperial period were um, captured war enemy, so they were uh, captured slaves. They had a particular market value. They would be assessed for whether they were physically fit and active and warlike. If they had um, good, these good qualities, there was a market for them to be sold to wealthy businessmen to put on public displays of, um, of death. Uh, as we'll see, um, the gladiator didn't Gladiators, at, as time progressed, particularly in the imperial period, didn't always die. So a fight between two gladiators usually did not end in the death of an individual. Um, quite often in these imperial period contests, once someone was debilitated and was down on the ground bleeding, the question would be put, it could be put, to the audience, is this person to be put to death? Did they show cowardice? Did they not really fight with vigor? But if they had, and they could be put to death and would be put to death, but if they uh, had put on a good fight, but had been wounded and lay on the ground and surrendered, the audience or the editor, the person putting on the fight, could make the decision, they'd put on a good fight, they'd to be patched up and, and fight another day. So this kind of gladiatorial uh, stealer, which I'll talk about more in a moment, show, this is a tombstone, it shows the victory wreaths. So he's won a number of contests over quite a, probably a considerable period of time. As we come down into the late Republican period, we know from representational and in some inscriptional evidence that Gladiators were increasingly wearing body armor, the lorica squamata, which was a type of chain mail with small uh, rectangular scales stitched onto a leather jerkin. So the idea was, in, certainly in late Republican times, more protection is being given to the, particularly the chest and, up, and upper torso, so that you're not going to get a serious wound uh, in that area, you have to, the, the competitors have to be more clever in how they hit their opponents. So it's taking away the element of uh, bad luck um, protecting the vital organs of the chest. So this seems this idea of the armor seems to come from um, those Campanian fighters that we saw in South Italy. Already in late Republican times, the gladiators are using the gladius hispanensis, the uh, medium-sized sword, which uh, was for close combat. And the gladiator gets his name from the gladius, the short sword of the Roman world. We know that that type of sword um, was already being used in the third century BC, but gladiators don't start to appear with it until a bit later, uh, mainly the uh, first century BC. Roman authors of the period, particularly Livy, have left us with some descriptions of Republican gladiators, and there are uh, types of fighters that are referred to, which seem to be the certainly are the precursors of what would later become the standard gladiators of the imperial period, and um, the fighters that are being captured are the enemy of Rome in the third century. So we're talking about the Samnites of central Italy. Um, so we hear about the Samnis a type of gladiator who is dressed as a Samnite fighting subsequently after capture. So he's a heavily armed uh, man. He uh, is using, of, of course, the gladius. He often has uh, a large shield, the scutum, and he wears a greave on his left leg. So he might have armor similar to this. The Romans were also actively fighting against the Gauls. So in late Republican times, we hear about a category of gladiator called the Gallus. So we see um, 
the Semnite, Semnus, the Semnite, the Gaul, also the Thrax, the Thracian, because the Romans were actively conquering Macedonian worlds and encountering the Thracian fighters. So the Thrax becomes uh, one of these competitors. Um, increasingly in the second and first century BC, these fights are n not being used at funerals anymore. They're increasingly being put on as public entertainment in, in the civic areas of Rome itself. Uh, they're becoming grander and much uh, better organized. In, the, in this period, particularly in the first century BC, uh, we have the development of gladiator schools, the ludi. Um, they were set up uh, all through Italy and they became a common feature subsequently of large towns throughout the empire to have a ludus. Um, they mostly were erected by wealthy private citizens who are interested in entertaining the crowd, but they could be uh, also created at public expense. The cities themselves might be interested in, in forming a ludus. Later on, of course, the emperor himself would establish the ludus. An early owner of um, a ludus was Julius Caesar, very wealthy uh, Roman businessman and politician. He had 1,000 gladiators, and they would have all been captured uh, Gallic people, largely. Uh, so he's housing them in the ludus and training them and using them to curry favor with the electorate to um, establish a good uh, relationship and to get back into, into office. He was one of just uh, a number of wealthy private uh, politicians who are setting up these uh, schools or these, the ludus. Usually the control of the ludus was handed over to a lanista, a kind of manager. And he, the lanista was usually the, an ex-gladiator, someone who, we should remember that um, gladiators could be retired if they had performed well had had their career and their owners could retire them and they would then subsequently be kept on by the owner of the ludus as a lanista to control and manage the training of gladiators. So um, quite often they uh, are shown as in this scene, they're observing the training, they often have a stick and they would whack the uh, the gladiator if they weren't putting up their effort in completely. So this is somebody who's um, training the gladiators, bringing them up to par, controlling the business, looking after the business for the owner of the ludus. The, um, the games could be uh, hired out, or the gladiators could be hired out by the ludus, and that increasingly becomes the case in late Republican, early Imperial times, where the uh, uh, a wealthy person in society may not own the slaves, but he'd rent them, and he was called the editor. The editor would put on some games, hire the slaves, and be responsible for what happened to those gladiators down the track. Um, so, certainly in late Republican times, the ludus, the ludi, were located in the countryside rather than mainly in the city, and particularly in the area uh, around Naples and Capua. That seems to have been uh, become the main centre for uh, these gladiatorial schools. Because the gladiators had been captured in war anywhere in the Roman world and had been acquired by the owner of the ludus, they, they were really a multicultural uh, group of people fighting uh, together side by side. 
and quite often they were training with the person who they could appear with in the future in the arena uh, so it would have been uh, the case that you're you're training with the person who kills you down the track um, one of the most famous ludi was the ludus of uh, Pompeii it's located right next to the theater of Pompeii and we know that in early imperial times uh, a large uh, group of gladiators was based here um, it had previously been used in association with the theatre but got taken over uh, by a troop of gladiators. Archaeological excavation of Pompeii at the Ludus uncovered um, armour, helmets, greaves, shields and belts in the individual cells of the gladiators uh, accommodation so it's a very rich uh, discovery by archaeologists of the actual artifacts associated with gladiatorial combat in the case of the uh, ludus at Pompeii we know that there are about 140 gladiators housed in the in the accommodation uh, there was a kitchen, a dining room and storerooms and meeting rooms and the gladiators trained in the open courtyard um, and there was also a stable one room uh, was preserved with shackles on the wall so some of the gladiators must have been shackled to uh, the wall they couldn't be trusted just to move about freely in the ludus a lot of um, interesting information about uh, gladiators, early imperial gladiators, comes from Pompeii. Uh, so we have lots of graffiti about these individuals and their status in society. We should uh, keep in mind that the gladiators sometimes could be the uh, rugby league or AFL uh, glamour um, individuals of their day. They were, they were often followed by uh, groupies who uh, wanted to talk to them, etc. So we have some graffito saying things like, one for uh, the gladiator, Celadus, is one who, for whom the girls sigh for. So that was at least his opinion of himself. And another crescens was um, the netter of girls at night. So he was the... <laughs> Uh, the one who was able to gather the girls. Uh, gladiators could themselves be personalities, certainly, and many North African mosaics uh, name individual gladiators. So they were personalities, they were the pop stars of their day, people were interested in their fights and their careers. And so in uh, mosaics like this, you actually have individual um, gladiators named. I couldn't find an ancient representation of a palace, but um, but uh, this is from TV. Uh, the gladiators trained with an upright wooden uh, opponent called a palace, um, a wooden post. Sometimes it could rotate. Uh, so we see one in this case training would be with wooden swords um, you would be learning uh, offensive and defensive moves and quite often the training of the gladiators in the ludus would be would take months or even years only in the later phase of training would a gladiator use real weapons so they're, they're using wooden implements the training of gladiators and their bodily uh, health was in the control of the doctores and the doctores would be uh, often an ex-gladiator they would be looking after the the physical health and well-being of the slaves of the gladiators and also um, 
providing medical treatment when needed. The gladiators of, of the imperial period uh, lived in difficult conditions. They lived in, a, in an environment of brutality. They faced death in the arena. And within the ludus itself, there would have been a well-defined hierarchy, uh, those who had a long and success, uh, successful career, as opposed to juniors. We know that the conditions were pretty bad, and the cells in the ludus at Pompeii were about four meters uh, square. They slept on the ground on straw and two to three men to a cell. So it uh, was unpleasant, uh, close living conditions enclosed within the ludus. Some gladiators were free to leave the ludus and could go out into the streets. Uh, those that could be trusted. But as I said, uh, some individuals were shackled and obviously could not, be, um, could not be relied on to come back. Um, the slaves had female companions living with them, quite often in the ludus. Uh, that was the contubernalis. So quite often we have evidence of uh, a common law slave wife of a gladiator. So um, these female partners often had lived with the, with the, with the gladiator in the ludus and could have um, children with them. And they're often referred to on tombstones, grave stealer, like this guy, Urbicus. He died at the age of 22 in his eighth fight, leaving a wife, Lorica, and a five-month-old daughter, Fortunensis. So the gravestone is quite, in these gravestones are quite interesting because they give us information about the life of the gladiators. The gladiators weren't just enclosed prisoners, but they actually had female companions living with them uh, in pretty seedy conditions. And this contour banalis would have been a slave as well, but she's been given to the gladiator to be his partner. One of the cells at Pompeii contained, uh, at the ludus of Cam uh, Pompeii, contained a female skeleton wearing jewellery, and she has been considered to be one of these tent mates of the gladiators. Yeah. It's not, in, not impossible that she was, she was living in the ludus. Um, Juvenal, the poet, uh, Roman poet of the imperial period, talks about the gladiators and how revolting their food was. Um, it, he refers to it as miscellanea, uh, which means... Um, whatever happens to be uh, around at the time, miscellanea, potluck. Um, but it was nourishing and uh, certainly provided carbohydrates. It was mainly a mixture of cheap grain mixed with uh, some vegetables. Doesn't look very appetizing to me. But uh, it was high energy food. Um, in the imperial period, as we enter into the imperial period, private ownership of the ludi starts to decline, and uh, it's more and more falling to the Roman emperors to control the ludi and to provide public entertainment of uh, groups of gladiators. One of the most uh, important of these ludi was the ludus magnus, in Rome. If you've been to Rome, you might have seen it. It's next to the Colosseum in Rome. It's the training school that's been partially preserved. Um, it was, seems to have been built uh, in the period of Domitian, uh, enlarged by Trajan and Hadrian. 
and um, that's a photograph that I took of it some years ago. So half of the arena has been exposed. So you can see where the cells of the gladiator there on the left and you can see where they trained in the central arena. So there must have been, certainly here it was quite a grand high status kind of complex of rooms with um, all the assorted other personnel as well as the gladiators. So it's quite a sophisticated piece of urban architecture in the heart of Rome. Another of these ludi have been found at um, Carnuntum, the site of Carnuntum, I think I in near Vienna. And um, this is, it's been possible to completely expose the ludus here. So it's a nice example where archaeology can really uh, give us some information. It was excavated from 1923 to 1930. And as a result of that, we have a complete uh, ludus to investigate. So it covers an area of 2,800 square meters, had an inner courtyard with a small arena for uh, training. We know that at the Ludus Magnus in Rome, the audience was allowed in, so it's a little bit like going to the footy training. Uh, you can go and watch your favorite gladiators training in the, in the school. So that probably also was the case with many of these provincial ludi as well. Uh, the armour of the imperial gladiators was much more sophisticated uh, and usually gladiators were teamed up in such a way that they had different uh, personalities, different armour, uh, but ideally they were given some kind of equality in the terms of their ability to survive. So fighters were often mixed up. Parts of their bodies would be exposed, others protected. And so in this case, gladiators often have their sword arm protected by a segmenter armor. The shield and chest often not um, covered. But increasingly in the imperial period, the breastplate, the provocatore was um, was used to protect the upper part of the chest. They also used manikai, which is um, padding of the legs to avoid injury below the shield to ensure that they didn't become incapacitated too quickly. So the aim of these different types of armor was to protect the most vulnerable parts of the body and to really um, require some precision and skill for the for uh, debilitating injuries. As we come into the imperial period there was increasing standardization of the armor and it's usually quite easy to um, identify specific character types in the imperial period from their armor. Uh, certainly in this period there is increasing interest in keeping the gladiators alive. Uh, if a gladiator is badly wounded and on the ground, uh, they will be carried out of the arena on a cart and handed over to the doctoris, the um, medical practitioners, to patch them up, um, etc. Sometimes the lanista would give them, uh, would have medical training as well. The most famous of these gladiator doctors was Galen of Pergamon, uh, one of the most famous doctors of antiquity. So he was uh, a Greek. Um, he started life as a gladiator patcher upper. So he would uh, receive the, the wounded coming out of the arena the owner of the, of the ludus wanted the gladiator to fight another day. He had fought quite well. He'd been wounded and incapacitated. And it was thought, you know, these, thing, these gladiators were too valuable to allow to be killed in a, in a competition like that. 
So Galen gained his uh, medical training by patching up gladiators and stitching them up and looking at their wounds and he would subsequently go on to be the greatest physician of the Roman world of course and uh, a prolific author of medical texts but that um, his knowledge stemmed from emergency patching up uh, there are many representations of gladiators uh, fighting the most famous one is the Zliten mosaic from Libya which shows different uh, uh, gladiators the main gladiator types were of a limited nature the mamillo, the fishman seems to be derived from the Samnus, the Samnite of uh, southern Italy in the Republican period so that's what he looks like he generally had uh, a bare torso he had a manica on his right arm so he usually had his right arm protected against cuts he wore uh, quite a heavy helmet with usually a crest on the top and he often had uh, manica on the legs for protection and a grieve as well so you, to get him down you really have to wound him in the torso area behind the shield so you're going to get a, a prolonged fight he's often fighting the hoplomachus sometimes he's fighting the retiaris so uh, the hoplomachus is another um, warrior standard warrior of the uh, Im imperial period or he could fight the Thracian the Thrax who also had uh, this element of armor quite often the Thrax had a griffin on his head uh, as a symbol so you're fighting a griffin that's the idea but perhaps the most famous of the gladiators was the Retiaris the uh, net man the fisherman uh, he has a, uh, a trident, he has a bound manica, manicus on his arm but he also has a protective guard, a metal guard that protects his chin that he can hide behind because he doesn't have a shield so it must have been rather nerve-wracking to go out as the fisherman and to have no shield to fend off attack he usually has a short sword and, a sp and the trident as his main weapons he could often be uh, put to fight against the Secuto, um, which is what we see here. Uh, he often wears the Galerus, which is this uh, piece of armor that protects his neck and head, the Galerus. And he has the Fusina, the trident and as we'll see um, some gla uh, gladiator skeletons are found with the holes of tridents in their heads uh, so we have examples where this clearly um, worked and the retiaris uh, often um, had the ability for close fighting apart from the trident with the pugio which is a kind of dagger uh, Sukuto, a type of uh, fishman as well, very limited vision. He wears a totally encapsulating helmet, and this was designed to try to give him less ability. So, if he's fighting the Retiaris, where is the Retiaris gone? I can't see him. So, it's easier for a Retiaris to stab him uh, with a trident or a Puccio. So we often see the Sukuto with a totally enclosing helmet uh, fighting a Ritiaris. In imperial times, competition took place in the arena, the amphitheater. And one of the most influential uh, types of buildings in antiquity and found throughout the Roman world. The city of Rome itself had no permanent amphitheatre until 55 BC and before that uh, gladiatorial fights took place in temporary buildings often in the Forum. Uh, 
And it was only subsequently in the late imperial, early, uh, early imperial period that uh, more sophisticated venues were um, being constructed. So uh, we have to imagine that amongst the uh, civic buildings of the Forum, gladiatorial fights would have been arranged in late Republican, early imperial uh, fights. The oldest surviving permanent uh, arena for gladiatorial combat is the one in Pompeii. That seems to be the first amphitheater. Um, and it's quite well dated to 70 BC. It's incorporated into the city when the city was uh, aggrandized. And uh, designed to house some thousands of citizens to watch uh, gladiatorial combat. We know a great deal about gladiatorial fights at Pompeii from graffiti. Quite often um, these will advertise coming fights, come to my, come to my fights, I'm putting on a show. I'm an editor, so I'm, I'm hiring gladiators and I'm going to put on a show in the uh, arena at Pompeii. And this is a very famous uh, fresco from Pompeii which actually shows uh, the amphitheater being used for gladiatorial combat. Back in Rome, the citizens traditionally watch gladiatorial fights in the Forum right through this period into early imperial periods. And it's in the period of Augustus that amphitheaters are really starting to be built in the Roman Empire. Like uh, at Merida in uh, Western Spain, which is from the period of 25 BC. So that, um, that arena was being erected in the time of Augustus. Beautifully decorated with frescoes, that one. The first stone amphitheatres in Rome were built in the Campus Martius uh, down by the river, but it doesn't survive. And subsequently there were fights in the Septa Julia, the voting uh, enclosure on the Campus Martius. We know that uh, fighting was taking place there. Nero built a lavish wooden amphitheatre in the Campus Martius uh, because there was no stone amphitheatre in Rome. The senators were reticent in early imperial times to permit gladiatorial fighting in permanent venues because they were concerned about the gathering together of a rowdy public mass of people and so there was no Ve permanent venue in Rome all through this period. So when we think of Nero and uh, putting on gladiatorial fights, uh, there was no Colosseum, there was no permanent venue right through that period. Uh, we have to, of course, wait for the Flavian period in the late first century AD when under Vespasian and Titus um, the uh, Colosseum was built financed by the spoils of war it became one of the greatest civic structures ever built in the Roman world absolutely massive truly stunning piece of um, architecture if we have a look at how the um, Colosseum was designed it was laid out in such a way that your status and position in society gave you access to viewing the crowd, uh, viewing the activities. So the emperor, magistrates and vestal virgins got the best seats at the very bottom of the arena. Uh, the equites, the equestrian class, the very wealthy class got the next. And Ladies, I'm afraid you were, uh, you were only allowed right up the back with the slaves. Um, and in fact, uh, there were many laws passed to limit the ability of women to go to the arena. It was considered to be uh, 
immoral and a good Roman woman didn't go to the arena to see gladiatorial fights. Um, you got a, a token when you went into the arena and it told you your area and your seat number. So the organization of the Colosseum was highly structured because you've got you know, tens of thousands of people moving into and out of this building and your specific uh, gate, in this case 52, you went in gate 52 and you went up the stairs and you got your specific seat number assigned. So it was highly uh, organized. Um, animals were a vital part of the gladiatorial event, were lifted up uh, into the arena to fight, highly elaborate structures. Um, I understand if you need to go, because I'm going to keep going a little beyond four, if that's all right. Um, the Colosseum was, like uh, many of these arenas, covered by canvas awning, the, um, the vela. Uh, so the audience was protected from the sun. And we know that Caesar set up awnings in the Forum already for games in 46 BC. But at the Colosseum, there was a very sophisticated uh, method of covering the audience and providing some shade. Great canvas awnings, the velarium. And the inscriptional evidence suggests that it took a thousand men to pull the canvas uh, awnings into position. And uh, they were often sailors who were brought up from Mycenaeum, the great port in, near Naples to unfurl the velarium. So it must have been spectacular in its day with the canvas awning. And uh, this interesting fresco that we saw earlier from Pompeii shows the velarium unfurled at Pompeii. Now, very briefly, I just wanted to... So are you okay to, for me to keep going just for a little bit longer? Um, I just want to talk about a typical day at the fights and then we're going to talk about the archaeological evidence of death of gladiators. Um, the one or two days before an event, an editor would be putting on a show, there would be a cena libera, a, a pre-fight banquet for the gladiators. So there would be a big public show, uh, usually on the evening of the fight. And this would have been open to the public so that they could have a look at the gladiators. A program would be posted up with the names of the gladiators. A libellus uh, was put up. And many of the gladiators took stage names like Tiger. <laughs> uh, you do wonder about Dove. <laughs> Not sure about that. I'm not sure about him. Um, so they would be personalities that people would be familiar with and, and the program would already have set out who was going to fight, who and when. A normal day in the arena started with animal fights, uh, the venatio, the hunt. Uh, so these would often be exotic animals uh, fighting gladiators fighting the Venetones, the hunters. And we've seen already that these have their origins in the triumphal processions of the Republican era uh, generals. Uh, these, so these were wild animal hunts taking place in the Forum or later on in the Colosseum. Um, quite often the Venetores, the hunters, would um, be prisoners of war, slaves, condemned criminals, but frequently volunteers. You could volunteer to uh, pitch yourself against a wild animal. So you didn't have to be a captured slave. You could be a member of the free society and say, I can kill a, I can kill a lion in the arena. And as a result of that, you could be a volunteer and you could um, win fame and fortune for killing the lion. So uh, that was one way that Freeborn was most frequently in the arena. Um, 
these kind of animal fights took place in many different venues, not just in the arena, but also in the Circus Maximus. They would close off a part of the circus and have animal fights. And usually the fighters just have a chest plate or they could just be in standard clothes. They're fantastic mosaics, aren't they? The showing these animal fights. They often had a spear, but increasingly, um, particularly in North Africa, in the arena, um, there was uh, an interest in seeing animals attacking each other. So, uh, if an animal fought well, it could re be reprieved. So, unlike uh, Spanish bull fighting today, where the bull always dies, uh, if an animal put on a good fight, it could receive missio, reprieve. So, here we have just animal fighting, watching animal fights. And this is an example from the uh, Zlitan mosaic where a bull and a bear are chained to each other for entertainment and um, they would have been who's going to win this contest so it could be a bear attacking ostriches something like that or lions fighting wild horses yeah some of these grand events could kill 9,000 animals in uh, a day um, and we know uh, in, at one event in 240 AD 70 lions died, 40 wild horses, 30 elephants, 30 leopards, 19 giraffe and 10 antelopes died <laughs> for the entertainment of the crowd and one poor old rhinoc rhinoceros. Um, so they were quite grand um, events. Around midday you had the execution of condemned criminals, the noxii, uh, and this is a famous representation where uh, a condemned individual is being wheeled out <laughs> to, to be attacked in the arena while you're having your lunch. Uh, the Zliten mosaic shows this. These are individuals that have been condemned to damnati, damnatio ad uh, bestia, so death by arena, death by beast. And here's another example where the individual has no chance of surviving. It's, um, it's death is the, you know, you're being ripped to shreds by a wild animal. So, uh, we know that uh, at some venues like Trier in uh, Germany that uh, the Noxi, um, the remains of condemned individuals have been found uh, and the graves contain mutilated corpses or just body parts that have been collected together as some of the skeletons are those of women and uh, so we should also keep in mind that as women also were noxi. Traditionally in Rome the bodies of the condemned criminals were thrown in the Tiber um, as punishment. Um, we should uh, also keep in mind that there were um, fights which were considered to be uh, without purpose, that's what sin missioni means, a certain death for the loser. So we, some fights were advertised in such a way that if you were wounded and incapacitated you were to be put to death so the audience would know that there would be a death in every fight but that wasn't that common it was mainly a case that the gladiators would be patched up and live to fight another day these kind of gladiatorial uh, 
Finistula, as I said, contain lots of interesting information about the life and death of the gladiators, and they've been, it's been possible to look at these uh, inscriptions and get some information. So, for instance, in the first century, um, we have a, evidence of 200 gladiators uh, involved in fights, but only 19 died. So the rest were being patched up to live and fight another day. So there was a good chance that if you fought bravely, you would be patched up and live another day. And if you fought very well, you could receive missio, which is to be released alive. And that was actually the standard outcome of gladiatorial life. Many gladiators fought for some years. They proved themselves to be really capable and their owners would give them missio. Um, and they could go on to be managers, lanista of uh, ludus, or uh, just given their pardon and, and be freed. So we have um, good examples of all of these activities. The reality, in reality, the odds of survival depended on your ability. So if you fought bravely, you wounded your opponent, you would be taken off the arena and you'd be patched up and live to fight another day. So most gladiatorial fights did not end in a death. That was uh, ex uh, the oddity. We know from some gravestones that gladiators would, could and did win 30 bouts. And some actually refer to 150 bouts during their career in which they uh, lived and then were manumitted or received missio. Many of the epitaphs of gladiators also uh, give us information about how old they were when they died. And most of the gladiators are dying in their 20s. So um, they having a career and they're dying maybe at the age of 25 or 27. Um, so it's studies of these gravestones have suggested that the life expectancy of a gladiator was 22 um, once you were cap a captured um, soldier. Uh, one individual, Flamma, died at the age of 30, having fought 33 fights. So that's a fantastic uh, long career. <coughs> Other gladiators were uh, retired because of perceived decrepitude in the late 30s. It was considered to be too old, and the inscription tells us they were freed after 18 or 11 bouts. And I just want to finish up by talking about two important sites, Ephesus uh, being one of them and York being the other. Two cemeteries belonging to gladiators have been excavated, one in Ephesus and one in York in the UK. So um, Ephesus, the gladiator cemetery, uh, quite well known. Many gla uh, gladiator gravestones have been found. There's a special cemetery for gladiators actually at Ephesus. Um, so we have many uh, examples of historical information about them and those, that information often tells us how old they were when they died, that sort of thing, and how many victories uh, that they'd had. We have had the chance at the cemetery of Ephesus to look at the skeletons and many of the gladiators that were buried in Ephesus had been put out of their misery by a swift hammer blow to the head. So it seems that they, the lanista or owner of the slave had come to the decision that they'd been badly wounded, they weren't going to survive, so clonk. Uh, they smashed their skull with a hammer. But at Ephesus, we've got a really rich evidence of actual um, gladiatorial combat wounds. And they include trident wounds to the head, which, uh, which I think is kind of uh, quite uh, remarkable that that physical evidence has survived. And lots of uh, 
investigation of the bones of these gladiators have obviously been taking, have taken place. Many of the bones have been analysed and they indicate that um, the, the gladiators had a good diet, that they were well maintained, that they were being given uh, quality food and often were patched up. So the doctores were patching up a wounded gladiator and shoving them back out eventually to, to combat again. So the, uh, certainly the Ephesus Cemetery has been very interesting. Archaeologists in York have uncovered a cemetery of 80 um, skeletons, um, 60 of which showed evidence of violent death, and they all seem to be gladiators. Um, one of the interesting things about the skeletons in York is that um, the sword arm tends to be more developed than the shield arm because you're, so the musculature and the physicality of that arm is often significantly different to the other arm which is just, which is holding the shield. Uh, and this must have been as a result of sword practice and obviously combat in the arena. Um, there's a lot of evidence for deep cut, deep wounds with a gladius. So quite a lot of the York uh, skeletal remains show gladius wounds to the head. And one of the skeletons showed evidence of having been uh, injured by a large animal, probably a bear or a lion. Um, their pelvis was attacked by a wild animal. So there's actual physical evidence of, of death in the arena by wild animal, which is quite amazing. Uh, quite a few of these gladiators still had metal rings around their ankles. Uh, these are the shackles of a slave. So they're going out into the arena with the bonds of slavery, uh, symbols of slavery around their legs. And, and as we said, in the, certainly in the case of Ephesus, but also here in York, uh, wounded and dying gladiators were often given a finishing blow to the head to put them out of their misery. So they, uh, many of them seem to have a great, you know, great caved-in heads. How tall is it? Um, they're shorter than we are, as a general rule, the Romans are shorter than us because of a poorer diet. So we generally are taller than ancient people. Uh, so we're talking 160, 170 centimetres, something like that. Uh, one of the gladiators had their spine uh, cut, so that obviously so it's, it's fascinating to look at those physical remains. Um, I'm just finishing up now. The Christianization of the empire uh, resulted in the decline and disappearance of gladiatorial games. And church authorities from early days, from the fourth century onwards, were unrelenting in their attack of um, these kind of spectacles, which were seen as pagan and uh, unchristian. Uh, they also believed or argued that the games were more closely associated with pagan religious rituals as well, that it was inappropriate to watch these things. Um, so with the closure of um, the cults particularly, in the late 4th century, uh, gladiatorial fights in the arena uh, disappear. And subsequently, in the Byzantine period, really, the circus takes the place of the gladiatorial arena as the centre of public entertainment. Thank you very much. <laughs>